there was the question of whether everyone would get removed, but now that they've been severed, you know, that's that's not at, you know at risk either. So I I think that it's going to be interesting to me to see how quickly the Supreme Court gets around to this. They've acted quickly in the past with things like the Lindsey Graham subpoena challenge and and that kind of thing. So potentially that could happen again here, but the power is very much in these appellate court's hands in terms of how much this trial could be delayed and and whether it happens before the election. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 4th, 2023. It's been a eventful few days in Fulton County, a flurry of orders, a flurry of briefings. The former president decided he wasn't going to seek removal to federal court. We're waiting for the 11th Circuit to rule on other people's removals. Other removals have been denied. It's been just a lot of stuff going on. So I thought it was time to catch up with Anna Bauer, who joined me in the virtual jungle studio. And you can see us on YouTube. We talked about all kinds of things. We talked about whether this case is really going to trial on October 23rd. We talked about the plea. There was a plea in this case. A bail bondsman named Scott Hall pleaded out. He got a good deal. Are other people going to take it? We talked about why Donald Trump is not seeking removal. And we talked about all the people who want removal who just can't seem to get it. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 4th, an update on Fulton County from Anna Bauer. So, Anna, a lot has happened in Fulton County uh, since we last talked just a few days ago, and I thought we should go through it all in no particular order. A lot of this happened Friday afternoon, so let's start there. We seem to have our first plea deal in Fulton County. Who is Scott Hall? What did he plea to? And what is the significance of the plea? Right. So yes, we do have our first plea deal. It is the also the first co-defendant in any of Trump's criminal cases to uh, strike a plea deal. Scott Hall is one of the individuals who was involved in the Coffee County breach of voting systems and and copying of voting equipment there on January 7th, 2021. Uh, We wrote a very lengthy piece about uh, Hall's involvement in Coffee County at the time, but- And by we, you mean you. Me, yes. (laughs) Well, but it was a team effort. And Hall, of course- is someone who, you know, beyond Coffee County also had connections to people like Jeffrey Clark. Uh, the, in the indictment, it is mentioned that Hall and Clark had a 63 minute phone call um, at a pretty crucial time um, ahead of all of the happenings with Clark trying to send uh, a letter that uh, allegedly falsely claimed that DOJ had found uh, evidence of fraud and that that would be a reason for the Georgia state legislature to convene and and potentially uh, select or appoint their own electors. So there are things beyond just the Coffee County breach that that Scott Hall was involved in within this alleged racketeering conspiracy. I'd also mention as well that the indictment discusses, you know, phone calls that he had with people uh, like Harrison Floyd, uh, who was involved in the harassment campaign against election workers in Georgia. So there, there are things that Scott Hall potentially has personal knowledge about that it could be very significant in proving up the conspiracy for the state. So that is significant in terms of what he plead to. So so if, if folks recall, Scott Hall was charged with not only the main racketeering charge, which every all of the 19 defendants in Fulton County are charged with, but he also had six felony counts that involved things like conspiracy to commit election fraud, conspiracy to commit computer trespass, 
conspiracy to commit invasion of privacy, lots of things that related to that breach and copying of voting systems in Coffee County. And as a part of this plea deal, he has he was sentenced and said to a, pro- a five-year probationary sentence for five misdemeanor counts uh, for conspiracy to commit election interference. I believe that that's the name of the the, the misdemeanor charge. So he he very much avoided, you know, what could have been one of the more serious instances of of potential jail time in this case, because some of these computer trespass charges, speaking to Georgia attorneys, it seems like the computer theft and computer trespass charges are the ones that are the most likely to potentially carry uh, significant jail time. As well as the RICO case, RICO charge itself. Right, right. The RICO charge itself as well, but because... Because a lot of these folks do not have, uh, you know, criminal history, and I know that it's been reported by some folks, and even Fonnie Willis herself has suggested that there is a minimum uh, prison sentence for the RICO charge, but that's actually not uh, the case. Um, it is, it is true that the, uh, even for a RICO charge, while you know that very well could carry prison time, it's also possible that some of these folks are sentenced to a probationary sentence for that RICO charge even. But I I do think though, you know, talking to people and looking at past RICO cases, for example, the APS case, which was the Atlanta public school cheating case, those teachers who were charged with some of the very similar things like filing false documents and that kind of thing, uh, some of the ringleaders there, they did get serious prison time, you know, for six months to a year or more. So it, it's it's very much the case here that I think that with these RICO charges, it, it does carry uh, the potential for some serious jail time, especially for those people who are kind of at the top of the RICO chain. But in terms of Hall, it it does seem like this was a very generous deal. Um, There are some other conditions, Ben, that maybe we want to talk about. You know, he has to write a letter of apology. That's really like school marmy, I got to say, to to have, you know, make your defendant write a letter of apology. I'm sure it'll be very sincere. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure. Um, He he also is banned from polling or election-related activities. He has to pay a $5,000 fine. All the those things. But the big thing here is that he is required to testify truthfully in any future proceedings. And and so that effectively means that he has, quote, flipped. We've been hearing people throw that term out a lot, but I think this is actually one case in which it seems uh, to be quite accurate to say that he has flipped. He is cooperating now with the prosecution and and will be required to testify likely against his code her former co-defendants and that's a big deal like i yeah. said you know scott hall it's not just coffee county it's you know he has in the indictment there's a lot of these ov- overt acts that are m- mention hall and mention phone calls he was making to a lot of these people within the alleged conspiracy, not just to the Coffee County folks. So there's one other thing that is probably not a big deal for others, but I suspect is a big deal for Scott Hall, which is he has to turn in his firearm. Um, which given that he is a bail bondsman, if memory serves by profession, is probably no small issue for his livelihood, no? You know, I I I I need to look into this, but I think that Scott Hall, there was some scandal in a different county in which Hall had been investigated for something totally unrelated to election 2020 election. And I and I think that he actually ended up having to turn his bail bondsman business over to his business partners. So I'm not entirely sure. He may be out of that business already. Former bail bondsman. (laughs) <laughs> right. So I, I, he was, though, a really, you know, he loomed large in the bail bondsman business in Georgia. He was a very well-known bail bondsman and uh, had been quite successful. But and this is something I've been meaning to to look into more. But I, I my understanding is that he may be out of the business. Gotcha. Now. All right. So if I am say, Sidney Powell's lawyer, Mr. Rafferty, or 
Mr. Chesborough's lawyer, whom lawyers whom you and I spent some time with the other day, I would be looking at this and I would, I think, feel a professional obligation to my clients to advise them that a deal like this, maybe not for Powell, whose testimony would be pretty useless to Fonnie Willis, but for Chesborough, this is a very good deal. And I am wondering if you see this as particularly with respect to the people whose trials are coming up, and we're going to get to the question of how many of those there are in a moment. But I mean, you look at this and it's a no jail time. You have to testify and you have probation. It's not a bad deal. Should we expect a raft of others of these in the next few weeks? I don't know. It is a very good deal, like I said, but I think that there's a lot of things going on here that maybe would make the usual incentives a little bit more complicated in terms of playing out. You know, there are people here, I think, who, and I'm not making any claims about this, about any one person, but I think that just generally that there are many of these defendants who could still are kind of, you know, true believers, so to speak, in terms of believing that Trump really did win the 2020 election and that they were vindicated and and doing, uh, you know, what they did or, or, or they're still loyal to Trump. A lot of them have been speaking out and are very ardently defending themselves uh, in ways that you usually don't see criminal defendants doing by going out and speaking to the media and making these these statements. Um, so I I'm not entirely sure. Chesbro's attorneys, Ben, as you know from our conversation, seemed to be very adamant that there would not be right. a, a, a plea deal on the table, um, that they would not accept that, that they are convinced of Mr. Chesbro's innocence and his case. Um, so I, I don't know if we can expect that from Ken Chesbro, but it does seem like he'd be someone who would potentially be you know, a good candidate for a deal. And is there anybody else among the 17 who you look at, or 18, 17, who you look at and you say, now they haven't, they're not really speaking out. They're relatively minor fish from a, a Fonnie Willis point of view. And they, they know more than they are valuable as a defendant. And therefore, I'm kind of looking for so-and-so to plead out. Right. So one of those folks that I'd mention is Misty Hampton, especially now that Scott Hall has flipped. Misty Hampton is the former election supervisor in Coffee County. She is the one who allegedly invited these uh, forensic imaging uh, folks and and had communications with people who were on you know the Giuliani legal team. She allegedly you know had been sending this invitation to Catherine Freis through an attorney named Pre Preston Halliburton. So she has a lot of knowledge about the Coffee County prong of the conspiracy, and she's someone who also you know lost her job after. After these events, uh, allegedly for, you know, unrelated timesheets, uh, fudging her timesheets, but uh, she lost her job. She, uh, you know, had another job for a little while. I, I'm not entirely sure what her employment status is now, but I say all of this to say that she might be someone who not only is, you know, a smaller fi fish who has knowledge that could be useful, but is also someone who maybe is feeling some of the financial incentives to strike a deal because she might be someone who, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of money to spend on a very expensive RICO case in her defense. She doesn't have the high profile name to get funding from a, a, a GoFundMe like people like Jenna, Jenna Ellis can do. Um, so I, I, I kind of have my eye on Misty Hampton as, as someone who might have some incentives here to, to strike a deal. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so we have a trial coming up, allegedly in 20 days, of at least Mr. Chesborough and uh, Sidney Powell. Also on Friday, the, uh, the judge, uh, Judge McAfee, made reference to the fact that there may be more defendants packed into that trial. So what's going on and how many people are going to trial this month? Right. So if if folks remember, Judge McAfee severed the group of 17 from Chesbro and Powell, who are the people who demanded a speedy trial. They are set for trial at the end of this month. But one of the complicating factors here is that Judge McAfee said, if you, you know, want to not go to trial, you're going to have to waive your speedy trial rights. And he kind of instructed these folks to, you know, file these waivers. And and that and I think the reasoning there is that it avoids, you know, some of the gamesmanship of these defendants who maybe don't want to go to trial in October, but do want to be severed from the group of 17, you know, waiting until an opportune time to, you know, demand their, uh, make their speedy trial demand and, and then affect severance from everyone. And, and it just, from a judicial economy and efficiency perspective, he's trying to make it more manageable so that he can keep uh, the group together or, or at least keep them in, in a manageable number of, of defendants. Um, so he he made this kind of statement in that order. He said he would return to the question of whether people who did not waive their speedy trial rights, you know, it, it, he, if they would be put with the October 23rd group or what would happen to them. He said that they would risk being automatically put with that speedy trial group with with Chesbro and Powell. So on Friday, he mentions this. He says that there's six people who have have not waived their speedy statutory speedy trial rights. He said that he would follow up with their counsel uh, by the end of that day. As we went through the day, and then also I think today as well, there were additional filings in which many of these defendants uh, did waive their speedy trial rights. That included people that I was watching, like John Eastman, who kind of entered an interesting waiver where he said that he would waive his speedy trial demand, but only as to, you know, this term of court. So I don't know if McAfee is going to be too pleased with that um, waiver, but we'll see. But one of the people who has not yet filed a waiver that I'm watching is Mike Roman, who, you know, is someone who has been quite quiet throughout all of this. Um, He's someone who was originally not in the recommendations from the special grand jury, uh, uh, the only one of these 19 who is not in the recommendations from the special grand jury for recommended for indictment, um, but then ultimately did end up in the indictment. So I, I think it's interesting that he has not yet waived. It could be the case that he ends up being put with Chesbro and Powell as a result but I, you know, we're just waiting to see what Judge McAfee is going to do about that because he mentioned that you know there's an analysis he's going to have to go through as he revisits, you know, whether or not to put the people who haven't waived into that group with Chesbro and Powell. So we'll see. And do we know when we will know? We don't know, and that's the thing with with many of of the of many of these orders that we're waiting on is we just have no idea uh, when we will know. Judge McAfee did not make any kind of statement about you know when he would decide. I would assume that he has to do so very quickly, and there is a motions hearing on Thursday. It, it may be the kind of thing where he you know, has some discussion about that at that motions hearing. But I think it's likely that before then we will see some kind of movement on on uh, this issue of, you know, will the state be trying three people instead of two people at the end of this month? All right, let's go to federal court where we also had a series of rulings on Friday afternoon. These ones are were no surprise, I think, but we have a series of 
new denials of motions to remove. So who is not being removed in federal court and what, what did Judge Steve Jones decide? Right. So uh, Judge Steve Jones decided that Jeffrey Clark, uh, who's the former DOJ official in the civil division, uh, will not be removed. And and also the three uh, so-called fake electors, uh, Kathy Latham, Sean Still, and, and David Schaefer will not be removed. You know, these opinions focused a lot on the the evidentiary burden that is required for removal. The the burden is on the removing party. So these defendants here, Judge Jones went through an analysis, uh, uh, you know, about the fact that none of none of these folks had testified or or um, introduced any witnesses. But he did take into account some of the you know declarations or other affidavit affidavits they that they had filed. But he ultimately decided that you know they had not sufficiently showed that in the case of the electors that they were federal officers or um, in the case of Jeffrey Clark that he was acting in the scope of his office. So I I think that it was something, as you said, Ben, that was expected. And we're now waiting, of course, to see what's going to happen with Mark Meadows because he has appealed. There's no indication, though, that any of these defendants Sean Still, David Schaefer, Kathy Latham, Jeffrey Clark, there's no indication yet that they intend to appeal. So so we will see whether they also choose to take their case to the 11th Circuit. Right. But none of them, they're going to, I assume they're going to wait till the 11th Circuit rules on Meadows because none of them really has a chance if Meadows doesn't prevail, right? Right. I think, I think that's right. And you know, I think that Meadows, it's always been the case that he has the best chance at removal. The briefing in at the 11th Circuit is done now. It's completed. Uh, the The last thing that they, they were waiting on today was uh, Meadows. Had, <laughs> Meadows, his attorneys had some issues uh, with some of the filings in terms of, you know, just technical deficiencies and getting the transcript order form in and all of that stuff that that the court needed for the record to be complete. Last I checked this morning, um, all of that had been put on the docket. So the briefing is complete. And now we're just waiting to see, is the 11th Circuit going to order oral argument? Uh, there's no indication yet whether they will or, or won't, which is a little bit interesting because I I figured that they'd move pretty quickly to schedule an, an oral argument, especially since they had ex- expedited the appeal. And then, you know, we're waiting to see, will an order be handed down? And if so, you know, will they affirm Judge Jones or or overturn it, that decision? And if it's affirmed, I suspect that Meadows will probably take it to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's slow down for a minute and unpack some of that. For those who don't remember, Mark Meadows, uh, as Anna says, has the strongest case for removal, but Judge Jones ruled pretty emphatically against removing the case to federal court. That is the ruling that is under discussion here. We don't know, am I right, anything about the panel, right? We don't know who's hearing this case at the 11th Circuit. No, and if 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 folks remember the Mark Meadows had initially asked for a stay pending appeal and we did know something about that panel who was going to decide whether or not to pause the state proceedings while Mark Meadows litigated his appeal. They were all uh appointees uh, of Democratic presidents and and so that gave people some speculation that that the court was maybe going to deny the stay and and as a part of that ruling of course one of the factors is uh likelihood of success on the merits and so that panel potentially had the opportunity to kind of uh make a ruling that hinted at you know some of the the reasoning that they would have made in terms of the case on the merits so the question of whether or not to actually overturn Judge Jones's decision. But in the 11th Circuit, usually what happens is that the panel that decides the question of a stay pending appeal 
is a different panel from the the judges who will decide the merits of the case, so to affirm or to overturn. So we don't know right now whether the panel is the same as as that state panel. It's likely different because usually these things are uh, randomly drawn, but it will be a three-judge panel um, who decides this. Of course, the 11th Circuit is known to be relatively conservative, but we will see. It's, it's, It's not clear to me what they will decide here. Um, And I think part of it may depend on the composition of the panel. Um, But it, it will be interesting to see what, who is on that panel. Of course, there are instances in the past of the 11th Circuit, even when it's a relatively conservative panel, they've decided against uh, people like Trump. Just ask Eileen Cannon. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, it's, it, that's not to say that even if the panel is, you know, Bill Pryor and uh, Andrew Brasher and Britt Grant, that doesn't mean that who are all, you know, Republican appointees, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to decide in Meadows' favor. So we will see. Yeah, this is an issue where it's not actually clear where conservative or liberal politics take you. Uh, right. That is like our conservative judges more or less likely to be have generous visions of removal in criminal cases involving executive branch officials than liberal judges. I don't think there's a political valence to that question, except that the president here's name is Donald Trump, right? And the chief of staff's name is Mark Meadows. Yeah. And it's really interesting because you know, there are some factors here, you know, like the strain of conservatism that uh, really cares about issues of federalism and and states' rights and and that kind of thing might put more emphasis on the state's interest in trying a criminal case in in its own criminal courts. Um, but then there's another, you know, brand of maybe what you might, say is a uh, judicial, you know, conservative politics uh, that it would focus on, you know, the executive branch and executive power. So someone like Britt Grant, who, you know, is used to work in the Bush administration and, and, and has a more robust vision of the executive and executive power and is more protective of that might be someone who um, makes a different decision from someone like Andrew Brasher, who is, you know, a former state, I, I believe it's a solicitor general or uh, attorney general in, in Alabama. So, uh, you know, it's really interesting to think about how those politics might map on to a right. decision about this particular issue. Right. And of course, the 11th Circuit panel is only a way station uh, here. I don't think it's likely that this question, at least at some point, is not resolved by the Supreme Court. It's hard for me to imagine that the question of whether this case gets tried in Fulton County or tried in federal district court in the Northern District of Georgia, that's a question that eventually the Supreme Court is going to want to answer, given the name of the defendant. Right. I I think so. And I think that it's going to be very interesting to see how quickly they choose to decide it. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, Ben, but uh, we've seen the 11th Circuit expedite this appeal I am hopeful that they will decide it uh, very quickly. Potentially, they don't have as much incentive to do so anymore because the the 17 defendants have been severed from the speedy trial demand defendants. So there's maybe not as much urgency to getting this decided before Meadows potentially has to go to trial in October. He's no longer you know at risk right. of that. But with these speedy trial defendants. One of the issues here is the question of whether, or there was the question of whether everyone would get removed, but now that they've been severed, you know, that's, that's not, at, you know, at risk either. So I, I think that it's going to be interesting to me 
to see how quickly the Supreme Court gets around to this. They've acted quickly in the past with things like the Lindsey Graham subpoena challenge and, and that kind of thing. So potentially that could happen again here. But the power is very much in these appellate court's hands in terms of how much this trial could be delayed and, and whether it happens before the election. I think that's right. And I also think the, you know, the Supreme Court has a choice in when to consider, when and how quickly to consider this question. You could not consider it now at all, just pass on on whatever appeal, and then treated on direct appeal, right? If Trump gets convicted or if Meadows, it's really Meadows is the relevant actor here. So if Meadows gets convicted and raises the issue, this should have been removed, that presents a federal issue from the Georgia Supreme Court to the Supreme Court. You could just deal with it then. So they could take the position, hey, we don't want to deal with this stuff up front. Let let Fulton County deal with it and then let the Georgia system deal with it and we'll deal with it on direct appeal. They could deal with it as the 11th Circuit has, which I think is uh, frankly laudable and attractive, which is deal with it up front and in an expeditious fashion while the underlying case is proceeding. And I think that's a very attractive mode. I, you know, I say that without knowing who the judges in question are. So I'm, you know, not biased by knowing that I like them because uh, we actually don't know who's doing this. But I think they're doing it in a very thoughtful way. Uh, you could also imagine them doing it in a way that freezes the underlying proceedings, doing it up front and, you know, putting some kind of a stay on the underlying case. That would be very disruptive. And so I think the Supreme Court has at least three distinct options leaving aside what it does about how to do it. And they play out very differently in terms of disruptiveness. Yeah, but I, I think one of the questions for me is what Judge McAfee does if they if if it's the first option where, you know, it's taken up on direct appeal but because I, I mean this is the kind of thing that Judge McAfee has said before he's concerned about getting this, you know, uh, these appellate court decisions on the uh, removal issue settled before the trial because of the double jeopardy issue that could be raised because under Georgia law, jeopardy attaches when the jury is sworn. Right. But that's only an issue if it's pending, if the, if the matter is pending. But if the 11th Circuit says we affirm... Judge Jones, and then the Supreme Court just doesn't hear it, then McAfee has clearance to go ahead. You're not going to run, you know, it's just that if Judge Jones is wrong after the fact, it may be grounds for reversal. I mean, but I, I but I think that that still presents the issue of like after the fact reversing, what would the procedural effect be on the conviction itself? And would the state still be able to retry Meadows in federal court if he's already like, do you know what I mean? I, I don't yeah, know. No, that I that's... think it, it would leave a big open question, but I, I'm just saying it's 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 an option available to the Supreme. The Supreme Court never has to hear a appeal. R right. And I and it's available to the Supreme Court. But again, I still don't think that it that it answers the question of how how will Judge McAfee react, you know, in terms of setting a trial date? Does that make sense? Because it'll be one of those do the best you can kind of yeah. things. All right. So there is one defendant who last week announced that he was not going to seek removal. And it right. was, drum roll, please, <laughs> Donald Trump. So why is Donald Trump? not seeking removal and are you surprised uh it's somewhat surprising although ben i got to hand it to you you called it we we spoke the week of the the decision not to remove 
And a few days before that notice was filed where uh, Steve Sadow, Trump's attorney, announced that they were had decided not to remove the case, uh, you said to me, I, I think they're maybe not going to remove. And so Ben Wittes called it, everyone. Yeah, but I didn't do it in public, so I'm not sure it counts. <laughs> But I'm announcing it now, so it counts. Yeah, yeah, I have a witness. Yeah, you do have a witness. So I think that maybe what's going on here is, as we discussed on that phone call when we were talking about this, Steve Sadow has been in these removal hearings uh, for Jeffrey Clark, for Mark Meadows, for the fake electors. He saw how it did not go very well for them before Judge Jones and and even you know it, it, even when Meadows testified it it did not go well for him he wasn't able to meet his burden before judge jones Th- things were really bad for the fake electors and for Jeffrey Clark and so he maybe realized that it, it's it's the kind of thing where strategically uh you know not filing for removal he he doesn't have to get, get up there and suffer a loss and reveal you know some of trump's anticipated defense um and argue about some of these factual issues now but he still potentially has the ability to remove to federal court by writing meadows coattails if the judge jones decision with meadows is reversed by the 11th circuit or scotus because they can make the argument that you know if one defendant is removed then the whole case should be removed so it's kind of a win or not quite a win-win but it's at least uh forgoing the risk of a of a of a loss it's in a not which, lose not lose right exactly and and they know that meadows as as we all do that meadows has the strongest case he he has very much has a stronger case than Donald Trump for removal I think so I, I think that you know this was a calculated decision about the risks that come with removal they probably weighed it as well against uh you know what they would get if they did get the case removed which Ben we've made the argument that you know Removing the case is not going to be a huge, right. you know, win for Trump. It's it's maybe a little bit more favorable, but all things considered, you know, the jury pool isn't that different. No, and actually, you know, if I am one of these defendants, I think I prefer to be in McAfee's court than in Jones's. Jones has not made a interstitial judgment in favor of one of these defendants on any issue. He's been, uh, I mean, he may be right about it all, but he's been, he's been an unfortunate judge for the defendants in these cases. McAfee has been much more, I don't know if it's been more even handed because the questions are different, but he's certainly given them some things that they've asked for. And so some of it may be a venue choice issue just in favor, you know, picked by judge rather than picked by jury pool or, you know, by not liking Fonnie Willis or the city of Atlanta or, you know, right. black voters. Right. And I think that is right, but I don't think it's right for the reason that many commentators have suggested, which is that McAfee has this background Uh, You know, apparently he was in the Federalist Society when he was at UGA in law school. He uh, was appointed by Governor Brian Kemp, who is a Republican. People have suggested that that is, you know, it's kind of judge shopping in that sense. But I actually I I really don't buy that reasoning. I I think that, you know, even though McAfee seems to have been quite fair and even handed, I don't get the sense at all that he is someone who is an Eileen Cannon type and has potentially, you know, partisan. no, I didn't. I didn't mean to suggest that at all. As you no, know, and I didn't I, think you did. Yeah, I, I've been very impressed with him. I think he's been doing an excellent job managing the court. My point is simply he is giving defense lawyers a very fair shake on their motions. He's being very thoughtful and careful about a whole bunch of things. Judge Jones, it's not that he's not being careful or thoughtful. 
Uh, he's had many fewer issues in front of them, and they they are ones in which you know candidly. Uh, with the exception of Meadows, they don't present very difficult problems. And he's dealt with them in a fashion that is kind of down the line uh, what MSNBC would want and expect him to do. And that's not necessarily inappropriate, although I do, as you know, disagree with him about the Meadows thing. But if you're uh, Sadow in your crocodile boots watching these and you say, who would I rather argue in front of? I don't know. Like McAfee's looks pretty good next to Jones from my point of view. No. And I, and I think that's right. And I didn't think that you were making the point that I was arguing against. I, I just wanted to be clear that I think there's a difference between arguing what you're arguing and then arguing, you know, that judge McAfee is, another version of Eileen Cannon because he was appointed by, by Brian Kemp or something. Right. I, I just don't think that's the case. All right. So let's, uh, let's, we're going to wrap up, but before we do, I just want to ask you, we've got 20 days until this trial is happening. Do you think it's really happening? I think it's really happening. It depends, you know, I like I've said before, I did get the sense when we spoke to Chesbro's attorneys that they are very much committed to having this trial in October and or at least this fall. With that said, they have mentioned, you know, publicly that they could seek some interlocutory appeals. That is a discretionary decision by Judge McAfee whether to allow them to do that. And and if that happens, that would mean that, you know, the proceedings uh, would basically pause at the superior court level and they would, you know, take the issue up to the court of a Georgia Court of Appeals. And 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 so we might not see the trial in October if they seek interlocutory appeal before the trial. And then Judge McAfee allows them that. So there could be a delay uh, on that basis that would toll the speedy trial demand uh, deadline. So um, it would not. I I thought that it potentially could waive the the speedy trial timeline, but um, it's actually just it tolls it. So it basically means that whenever it comes back down from the Court of Appeals, or other appellate courts, um, then that is when the clock restarts. Um, so uh, we will see. I will say I, I think that the big question for me right now is not necessarily, you know, will the trial actually start in at the end of October, but but it's also will how long will jury selection go on? Judge McAfee has said that he is committed to getting jury selection done by I think it's November 5th, which is when the state has to you know, bring the case to trial under the speedy trial statute. It's a little bit unclear under Georgia law whether you have to have the jury actually, you know, impaneled and sworn by that date, or if you just have to start jury selection by that date. And so for the reason to to kind of, you know, deal with that ambiguity in the law, Judge McAfee has said he wants to get the jury selected and sworn in by November 5th. But, you know, I'm not convinced that that will happen. Um, I was just reviewing some open records requests that I I did, um, and there's an email in there from an investigator in the district attorney's office who mentions that they expect jury selection will go on for a month, um, which would definitely take us over that deadline of November 5th. So I think that maybe that's a little bit more accurate in terms of you know, looking at past RICO cases and how long it's taken to select a jury and the high profile nature of this case. So we'll see. We are going to leave it there. Anna Bauer, I have this feeling we're going to talk again soon. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution, our audio engineers. This episode were the intrepid Noah Osband of Goat Rodeo and the intrepid Anna Hickey of Lawfare, who produced the YouTube video. Folks, 
I, I'm just going to look you in the eye. You got to imagine me looking you in the eye right now and say this. You need to become a material supporter of lawfare. We need everybody's participation to keep this kind of activity going. Regular coverage of four trials, regular discussions of, you know, every briefing, every ruling. No one else is doing it. We're bringing it to you. You know it's important. So become a material supporter of Lawfare. Lawfaremedia.org slash support. The Lawfare podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening and watching.